I will guarantee you, every one of these celebrities that we put up on a pedestal yeah. has at one point in their life shit their pants. <laughs> oh. So like that's that's the great equalizer right there, right? I, you know what? I'm gonna do that next time. If you meet anyone famous, just be like, yeah. I'm just picturing them. Just starting. look at them go, I know you've done it. You did. Once, at least once, everybody's done it. Come on. <laughs> at least once. <laughs> we're not even talking about as a child. We're talking about in their adult life. Yeah, no, I'm totally talking about it, the adult life. <laughs> I'm totally talking about the adult life. Eventually, they will do it. <laughs> Welcome to The Worst Asian Podcast, where a couple Asian American millennials give you our shitty opinions on all things Asian. My name is Linji. I'm here this morning with my co-host, as per usual, Ben. Yo, what's up? I have not been replaced yet. Why would you think you've been replaced? Because you threaten me all the time. And we haven't seen each other for almost a month now. Yeah, for real. I missed you though, for it's, real. It's a long time. Both went on vacation, but we'll catch up on that on a later episode. Yes, yes. Today, I kind of want to get right into it because I am super, super excited to have someone on the podcast today. Normally, I'm excited for every single guest that we have. You know, yeah. I tell them I love them on the pod and off the pod. Yeah, whether, you know, he or she is married. Doesn't so matter. Love, yeah. I love them all, platonically, exactly. of course. Yes, respectfully. I probably love our guest today, too. <laughs> but I am honestly really excited because we have someone on the podcast that we have both seen on TV and we have idolized. Is that the right word? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I think it's kind of like our generation, you know, like Uncle Phil. Oh, shit. Yeah. That's a bingo, Ben. That's actually a great reference. For those that Game. don't get it, Uncle Ben. Uncle Phil. <laughs> Uncle Ben. <laughs> Uncle Ben. Uncle Ben makes the rice. Rest in peace, too, though. To Uncle, Uncle Phil from uh, Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Gang. I really get that same vibe. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's so true. Yeah, with the beard and everything. You Gold know? star for you, Ben. Gold star for you. Yeah. Let's welcome onto the podcast award winning actor, writer, and comedian. You probably know him best from his role playing Appa on the show Kim's Convenience. Okay. But after consuming all his media on, on the internet, we have now found out that he is probably the most down to earth human being that we've ever seen. Yes, sir. And also, self proclaimed super geek. Mm -hmm. Let's give it up for Paul Sun Hyung Lee. Hey, hey, how's everybody doing? Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. Thank, Thank you, you Paul. Us. We really appreciate you coming on today. Seriously. For any one of our audience members that for some reason has no idea who you are, you want to do a quick intro on who you are and what you're about? Oh, yeah, I guess. I don't know. This is weird. <laughs> um, <laughs> first of all, I am Asian. Uh, yeah, yeah sure. no, I'm an, <laughs> I, I am an actor. Um, yeah, a father. I mean, it's in my... I, oh, my God, this is so... Like, I, I can't <laughs> yeah, put you on the right? spot yeah, there. You remember, Pavel's like, oh, yeah, I'm so comfortable. I'm very comfortable. Don't worry, I could check <laughs> that free ball. Here's yeah. your job. <laughs> uh, I'm, a, I'm primarily an actor, but uh, I'm also a father, a husband, a geek, a writer, comedian. Uh, I do it all. Uh, I love doing what I do. I'm very, um, in, in that sense uh, of being the worst Asian possible, I've eschewed all academics and sort of followed my, my creative instincts and heart and whatnot. And um, yeah, you might have seen me on a show called Kim's Convenience. Maybe. I've also Maybe. made appearances on uh, a Disney Plus show called uh, The Mandalorian and Book of Boba Fett. Yeah. Shout out to Carson Tava. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, yeah, so I'm an actor. So you might see me in a bunch of different things. But for the most part of my career before Kim's Convenience, I played a lot of bit parts, little little sort of day player roles where my speciality was exposition. Oh. When the writers found that, oh my God, we didn't, we, we need to get all this information across in a big info dump on mm -hmm. and use a disposable character for it they would bring me in and I would come in and barf out all this exposition and I'd either leave or get killed. And so that, that was kind of my specialty right there as a, as a character actor. Yeah. Obviously people know you from Kim's convenience, yeah. but um, I always shit on uh, YouTube and, you know, social media and the algorithm for various different reasons, the but almighty algorithm. the algorithm for some reason recommended bitter Asian dude to my feed on YouTube. Right. I had never seen you on YouTube before. I didn't know that you had this whole side. Um, well, not even side. Like this is this, the real this, you. Yeah, that's. I think that's the shocking part about all. Exactly. Of it. Yeah. So it's so amazing to see someone like you on TV that we thought maybe had a certain persona, and to find out that in right. real life it's the complete opposite. Right. So bitter Asian dude on YouTube. For people that don't know what that channel is about, can you give them a quick dive into it? Yeah, absolutely. That's my YouTube channel where I do. Like I was mentioned before, I am a self-professed super geek and nerd. I love 
Star Wars, sci-fi, Star Trek. Yes, the two can coexist. That you can be a fan of both franchises. <laughs> it's like being able to love the Beatles and Elvis at the same time. It is possible. Uh, so I, I grew up consuming all manner of geeky things, and uh, I still love those things. They're very near and dear to me because growing up, uh, it was very isolating for me. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the TV was my best friend in a lot of ways. And I, I love consuming stories. And I think that's where my love for the art sort of came from. But yeah, so Bitter Asian Dude Inc. started pre-pandemic. Everything was being locked down. We didn't know what we were doing. And my my youngest turned to me like I got this huge box set in. It was a 4K box set yeah. of the Skywalker saga. And it was 27 discs long. Uh, it had all these special, it came in a huge box, had all these uh, special features on them and these booklets and whatnot. And um, my youngest said, hey, why don't you just do a, an unboxing video, right? Because I was looking for stuff to do. And I thought, you know what? Yeah, why don't I? Because I'd seen him just sit there and watch these unboxing yes, videos. Yes, and they're, they're kind of like, I, I understood the allure, right? It's kind of like, yeah, you're, you're, you're living vicariously through it. And it's it's a good informational thing to do. Like if, if you're on the fence of whether it's something you want to purchase is worth it or not. Good point, yeah. You watch somebody else unbox it and it's like watching a live ad, right? So I did it and I fell in love with it. And if you look at my first video, it is so, it's just my iPhone plonked down on the kitchen table, me opening up this box set. And I had a lot of fun with it. And then I started watching more YouTube channels about it. And mm -hmm. I started to up my game a little bit. So like the camera got better, the sound got better. I started working on the presentation, the production Background, values went up. Yep. Yeah. I literally have a basement full of collectibles that I've accrued over the years. And a lot of them were sitting in boxes. And it was like, I have a lot of time. And so this is something for me to sort of invest in and, and do. And I just fell in love with it. And it's the channel grew from like, 10 people and I thought it was gonna, we were maxed out at 100, yeah. <laughs> but it's got 17,000 strong now and it's growing and it's it's crazy. But what's really wonderful is there's a huge geek community out there who are just as surprised that I love all this stuff. Yes. And um, you know, I think a lot of fans are like, oh my God, you're just like us. It's like, mm -hmm. well, yeah, you know, <laughs> of course I'm like you, I'm a human being. And there's nothing I do that is that much more spectacular. This is just my job being, my job is just more visible. But at the end of the day, it's a job for me. It's something I love to do. And it's kind of in the public eye a bit more. But I go home at night and I open up boxes of toys. <laughs> yeah. And, I, you know, I'll watch the same shows. And I love discussing the same shows, uh, you know, uh, on streaming services or, or movies and stuff like that. I'm involved in geek culture because it's something that I love to do. And so this is something uh, as well. I think we all have this common commonality as human beings mm -hmm. yeah. and uh it, it's very funny when somebody sort of thinks as you did that um you know i would have a different persona that i would be a bit more i guess mature is the word for it might be the word the thing is like when you be see celebrities or personalities on tv you sometimes put them on the pedestal like they're up on the mountain right mainly because you don't really see the other side of their lives so you you are forced to like kind of imagine yeah. in your head what his everyday day-to-day -day life must be like. Like eating caviar and- All the time. Hanging out <laughs> caviar, you know. Hanging out the pool, <laughs> you know. I will guarantee you, every one of these celebrities that we put up on a pedestal yeah. has at one point in their life shit their pants. <laughs> oh. So like that's that's the great equalizer right there, right? Uh, you know what? I'm going to do that next time. If you meet anyone famous, just be like, yeah. I'm just picturing them Just sharding. look at him go, I know you've done it. You did. Once, at least once, everybody's done it. Come on. <laughs> at least once. <laughs> We're not even talking about as a child. We're talking about in their adult life. Yeah, no, I'm totally talking about it, the adult life. <laughs> I'm totally talking about the adult life. Eventually they will do it. <laughs> but that's for me, that's how I carry, because they're, they're put on a pedestal because we put them there. And for me, because I grinded out my career all the way along, and it's, I've gotten success later on in my career, mm -hmm. I know how hard it is to work and to get to a certain level and the level that I'm at, I, I feel very fortunate. Now I've had to work very hard and I, I was ready yeah. for that opportunity when it came and I took advantage of that. But I, I also realized that as, as quickly as I got up on that pedestal, I can get knocked off. Right. Yeah. And so for me, deepest respect are to the fans and to people who put you up there because if they're not watching you, if they're not boosting you, if they're not uh, supporting you, you got not, you know, you're back to where you were. And so I've got a unique perspective on the industry where it's like, I know, like right now I'm living my best life and I'm, I'm on an upwards trajectory. I'm very happy mm -hmm. about that and mm -hmm. very grateful. But at the same time, I don't expect 
things. You know, it, it's that weird sort of... Yeah, you're trying to be realistic about things. Yeah, because I think once you start to take things for granted and start to think that you're actually better than other people, that's where trouble comes in. And for me, I've always... It's just been me. Like, I'm just this, this guy that lives in East York. Um, mm -hmm. I coach my kid's baseball team. I'm one of the coaches on his team. I like collecting collectibles. I yell at my kids. Yeah. I love my dog and my wife and, you know, like, it's just regular things. I'm, I'm just a dude who every once in a while might shard his pants. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's, just like all of us. That's, I'm the same as everybody else. That's a great equalizer. There you go. Back there, the shitting exactly. of the pants. <laughs> you know, once in a while, you might just have to shard. That's it. Your YouTube channel, um, Your Words Only, you said you do a half ass yeah. review of toys. You have a great drinking game, and is it is way too early right now for us to partake in some version of this drinking game, but you do this drinking game on air as well. Mm, yeah. I think the best part of watching some of your streams is that the community that you've built, because it's basically you chatting with the people that are coming in at the time, and it's so nice to see that you're basically chatting with every regular person that's there. Thank you. And, and that's, that's absolutely it too. Like I do mention it on the channel too, because there are regulars and we try to make it as open and inclusive. So if somebody's just popping in for the first time, mm -hmm. feel free to jump in on the chats and everybody's really supportive. And a lot of people, they'll say, Hey, welcome to the chat. I miss so much that goes on because people are having several different conversations in the chat feature and it's great. And I love it because they've made friends as well. And I have other friends who have YouTube channels and we will do the cross platform thing. Well, I'll be a guest on their channel. They'll be a guest on my channel yeah. and we'll do that. And all of our, all of our followers or, or subscribers will, will cross uh, and join each other's channels and stuff. And so there's a really cool community sense that's built because you recognize the names. And now that the pandemic is sort of ending or, or we're coming out to the tail end of it, the chance to meet them face to face is awesome. So oh, last true. weekend was, or the weekend before, two weeks ago was a fan expo here in Toronto. That's like our version of Comic-Con. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. It's the third largest uh, convention in North America. And I got to meet like several um, uh, several of the, the members of, of the YouTube community. For the first time, Face to face. Right? And it was so like... I don't know your real name, but I know your handle. So that's <laughs> awesome. And just getting to meet them is, is amazing. Nice. So that's something that I really, really like. I think that's the best thing. One of the best things that come out of this pandemic, which was such a shitty mess for everybody. It was. But yeah, one of the yeah. best things is, you know, making these really connections with each other and finding like-minded people. And my channel has always been about, you know, the geek life. But like, if that's not your jam, that's cool too. Like, Come and enjoy the chat, but it really is about supporting each other, uplifting each other, sending that message of positivity instead of just the regular, let's shit on everything and, and like be miserable together and, and throw dirt. Yeah, there's too much Sometimes. of that on the internet as is. Yeah, and I understand there's a form of catharsis with that, but you know, at the end, that kind of negativity just drags you down further and further and it's it just, it's a big hole. Right. And I would rather have people uplift and support than do the opposite because... Tearing something down is easy, super easy, but there's nothing to gain from it. Building each other up, man, you can create so much that way. And that, that's, that's the direction I want to go in life, on the chain, anything that I do, that's, I want to build. So, um, yeah, I, I, that's just one of the things, cause it's, it's too easy to get attention being negative right now, I think. And that's the problem. We need to reframe that narrative. Right. You have to find, you know, the positive in anything that you go through. Life can be really shitty sometimes, but it's when you can find the little things that you really enjoy, that's what you got to work for. Yeah. And I think what you have with this community is great. Um, can I ask you, how did this all start? Was it like a moment when you're a child or for your love of comics, you know, all action figures, Star Wars and stuff yeah. like that? So we immigrated, my family immigrated to Canada when I was three months old. And so my parents didn't speak any English and um, they both had to work uh, to, to sort of support the family. And so back then <laughs> you could leave your kids alone. Oh, yes. <laughs> you didn't have to have a babysitter, right? You could just leave them. Ah, they're fine. It's good. It's good. Here's a key. You're like, Tyler, we were latchkey kids because <laughs> we had true. a piece of yarn with a key attached to it. Like when we went to school, my sister and I, yeah, we would walk home together and like she would get on her hands and knees and I would step on her back to reach the lock. <laughs> oh my God. Um, and so, yeah, it was like that. And so it was, it was just my sister and I and the TV. So like I said, I would watch consume and like my favorite when i was younger younger of course looney tunes bugs bunny yeah, yeah roadrunner tom and jerry Damn, tom um, and jerry. you know i yeah, watch all classic. that stuff and then as 
yeah, as I got older, it was Star Trek. Yeah. Um, and Space 1999, Lost in Space. I watched Westerns too, space. right? Like the Rifleman, Gunsmoke. Yeah, Clint Eastwood um, stuff. Uh, Bonanza. Yeah. Yeah, stuff that was on TV, like movies, the Saturday morning movies, like in black and white. I would watch that stuff. And then uh, along the way, what happened was my dad took us, my very first movie was Star Wars. I was five years old. Oh. And he took my sister and I to see it. And Fuck. <laughs> I mean, I was blown away, right? Five-year-old kid. And it's, obviously, it's left a mark on me. Yeah, yeah. clearly. My entire life. And it's, yeah. And so, it, it's just that one thing where it just totally grabbed my imagination. And I think that's why I started watching Star Trek, too. Because there was nothing else, Star Wars-wise. It was just the movie. And then, so, the rest of the content was, like, a comic book, which I, like, read to death. It was all dog-eared. We recreated, we replayed that, but on TV to get that other fix too was Star Trek. And I love that. And then Space 1999, which I loved as well. Uh, Doctor Who was on, which I found was mm. too cerebral. And it's a great show now, but as a kid, you're like, ah, nothing's happening. Yeah. It's kind of like hard to grasp as a kid. Yeah. As a kid. And so that Star Wars for me was, that was the end all and the be all. And so like, and then the toys came out, right? Like you had to wait a bit, but the toys and then when Empire, by the time Empire Strikes Back came around, mm -hmm. I was fully entrenched in it because I was like, okay. And that's where my love of toys sort of came, sprung from as well, right? And collecting toys because it was, you had the different movies and the different action figures that went with it. It was different from, um, you know, collecting toy cars, which you could do if you like certain models, but this had like a continuation to it because of the characters and the stories, you know, the different versions of Han Solo, different versions of Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia yeah. and stuff. And it was, that's what started my whole obsession with collecting. And not because I needed to have them, it's because I wanted them so I could recreate scenes and play with them. Yeah. Oh, that's right? cool, that's, man. that's a thing. In the collecting community, there's two types. You have mint in box collectors, right? And dirty, filthy openers, basically, <laughs> right? Filthy. And so I'm in the camp of, I'm a dirty, filthy opener, but I do understand the whole mint and box thing. And so what's actually ended up happening, and there's another subset of collectors who will collect two of each item. Oh, one to yes. keep in a box, one to open and play with, right? And so you have that- The best of both worlds. There you go. And then you have others who will do like three, where they'll keep one mint in box, one to get autographed oh. and one to open and play with, oh, right? Oh, it just like keeps going. Doing stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's just, it's insane, right? Um, we have a, a running joke on my channel whenever I get a collectible that I'm ruining the resale value of it by, <laughs> by opening it. It's like, oh, look away. Uh, look uh, but away. then I'll flip it too and I'll go, here it is, mint in box and I'll notice a dent in the corner. I'll go, oh. it's like, it's fine, it's fine. It's fine, it's fine, and it's not fine, right? Because And I don't know what it is. It's like the whole, like, oh, my God, there's a... I spent how much on this? Like, it needs to be perfect so I can wreck it. Like, if I wreck it, that's one thing. Yeah. If somebody... If it comes damaged, you're kind of like, uh, yeah, okay, I'm going to open it anyways. But still, you're like... Oh. Someone else took that away from you. Exactly. Exactly, right? So... Uh, <laughs> Have you gotten any pushback from your family, from your wife especially, about the... Uh, oh, my God. Abundance, because I saw... <laughs> he's looking at her, he's like, oh, shit. She's at work right now. <laughs> so I can see it. Because no. uh, <laughs> I saw a recent stream where you mentioned that you had to get a storage shed for some of the extra stuff that you had now that does not yeah. in the basement. Yeah. And the funniest thing I think I heard you say <laughs> about this was you were saying if you die... <laughs> you want your wife to like not just give away this shit. Yeah. She needs to know this has value for resale. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she does. She does. Um, like a lot of things too. It's, it's she she totally gets it. A lot of the flack I get is just because of space. She's like, where are you uh, gonna put it? Where are you gonna put it? I'm like, it's not me actually getting it. It's like, where are you going to put it? Because there's literally no room left yes. <laughs> and it was funny because i was in vancouver for six months shooting avatar the last airbender mm -hmm. nice and while i was away i was you know feeling lonely because i was missing my family and stuff like that so i tried to fill that hole by getting more collectibles <laughs> and running my youtube channel out of uh, out of my place in vancouver and we nicknamed it the uh, west coast stash house and so i don't know how well i know how but it caught me by surprise, really, how much stuff I bought while I was at, and I had to ship it home. And while I was shipping it home, I was still getting stuff that I pre-ordered years ago, literally years and months ago, that was showing up. And when I got home finally, <laughs> I came down to the basement, and uh, my wife Anna said, "All your stuff is downstairs." I was like, "Oh, okay." And I came down, <laughs> and I shit you not, she put everything under my desk. It was like stacked 
like I couldn't get to my desk <laughs> to get access to my computer. I had to Tetris everything. <laughs> and it was the, the best passive aggressive display oh my uh, God. to make her point of where are you going to put all this shit? Yeah. Uh, shout that, out to the uh, wives. They know how to like stab you without really stabbing you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just to make a point. Yeah. But she gets it. And, um, you know, we, we exaggerate the, the level of antagonism there. Um, just because, and I've had to make good on my promise. So, like, certain parts of my collection, I'm calling. I'm actually getting rid of. I've stopped oh, really? collecting. Yeah, Hasbro Black Series, which is a line of toys, which I have a lot of. I'm selling <laughs> it. Selling it off to make more room. What about oh, those um, Hot Toys 1-6 uh, scale figures? Are you still on that? Yeah, that's why I'm selling the Black Series, because I'd rather collect Transitioning the, uh, from one to the other. Okay. You're just making, yeah. 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 It's really interesting, because it's like the Hot Toys, for those of you who don't know... It's a one six scale figures, and that's about that translates to like figures that are like a foot tall, basically. And the cool thing about it is they're super. I'm talking hyper detailed. Yeah, it's amazing. Right? Yeah, the sculpts. Check out the channel if you want to see. I usually unbox a hot toy uh, every episode, but it's not only just the figure, the sculpt of the figure itself. It's the detail in like the clothing. It's they're kind of like really super expensive dolls. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Except. The, the dolls, the clothes, you know how some dolls, like the clothes are called puffy and they yeah, look yeah, fake, yeah. like dolls clothes. These actually look like miniature human beings that have shrunk down. Like it's it's a bit- The detail's insane. Yeah, it's it, and it's a bit creepy sometimes because I remember, you know, I got the first ever hot toy I got was of Princess Leia, the Hoth version of it. And, you know, you open up the box and it's stunning, but it's creepy because they put a plastic bag over the head <laughs> to keep it from getting damaged. So- it looks like a serial killer is like, you know, it's like, oh my God, somebody killed, you know, Carrie Fisher and shrunk her down and put her body, her corpse in this little box. Uh, God rest her soul. But it, it's like you pull off, you look at the sculpt of the face and the paint application and it's, she looks real. Mm. It yeah, it's looks crazy. real. You could take a photograph of it. Like if you had a proper, and they have one six scale photographers who do that, you know, they'll create an entire diorama or maquette. And it looks like a screen grab from the actual movie. That's how detailed these figures are. That's exactly it. Please check out the YouTube channel, Bitter Asian Dude. You can do a quick yes. search on it. It is yeah. a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. As a Star Wars super fan, how amazing was it to actually play Carson Teva on the actual Star Wars property? That must have been... I don't even know what the right word is to describe it. It's like being in a dream. Yeah, no, and, and that's exactly it. Like, I still can't get over it. You know, yeah. it, it's just, this is something that imagine your wildest dream coming true. And that's like a 10th of the feeling <laughs> because yeah. I, I still don't feel like it's real, mm. you know, uh, like even when it, when it first happened, because first of all, you, you do it and then you have to wait so long before it comes out and then you can't talk about it for like, I couldn't talk about it for a year. That must have been hard for you. Uh, and that, and then you sort of forget. And then you're sort of like, was that real? Did <laughs> yeah. that actually happen? <laughs> right? Because it was just so, like, I cried during my wardrobe fitting. I cried so many times when wow. I was there, you know? The the first, because I, I got a set visit first because my, uh, a friend of mine from like 25 years ago, Deborah Chow is Canadian. And we worked together and, Deborah Chow is a director on, on Mandalorian season one. She's also the director and one of the creators for, for book, uh, for, for Obi-Wan Kenobi. Mm -hmm. Um, and we worked together way back, like in Toronto for, for a theater company that was going bankrupt at the time. And that, that's how I knew her. And, um, you know, bumped into her again in Los Angeles at this function. And she was like, do you remember me? I'm like, Oh my God, yes. <laughs> and so she got me a set visit because she said, you know, like, uh, Dave Filoni, who was one of the executive producers and one of the showrunners, uh, one of the co-creators on, on Mandalorian, he said, he's a big fan of Kim's Convenience. Mm. Oh. And he's, he's think he wants to write something for you. And I was like... Ah, <gasps> uh, Mitch had a heart attack right there. Yeah. That's, you know, I looked at her and went, fucking don't, don't fuck around with me on this. <laughs> right? <laughs> really? Really? It's like, yeah. I was like, holy shit. Yeah. She's, you know, when she told me that, <laughs> it was funny too, because I'd just gotten just... I was heavily into cosplay as well. Mm -hmm. And so I cosplay. So I, I have a number of, of screen accurate Star Wars costumes <laughs> at home already because I am a member of the 501st Legion. Yes. The Canadian Garrison. And that, for those of you who don't know, that's a cosplaying group that is, um, they are, are they officially sanctioned? They are uh, a cosplaying group with screen accurate cost Star Wars costumes that are uh, sort of representatives, not really, but it's this weird thing. Lucasfilm lets them do use 
the you know the the likenesses and all this stuff to recreate these costumes as long as it's for charity. Okay. And so that's what they do. So whenever you see like a publicity event with a ton of stormtroopers right. or imperial officers or Darth Vader or droids or whatever, the majority of time it's from the local 501st garrison oh. in that region and they will go out and they will troop in costume and all of it is for charity. None they don't see a dime of it. They collect money, they'll they'll accept a gig if you donate to either a children's hospital or make a wish foundation That's amazing. or one of these things, it depends on each garrison, uh, who they are affiliated with, but it's, it's, it's a charity group. And so I joined them back in like October of 2018 and I have several costumes that have been approved and stuff and they have to be screen accurate for you to get a, approval into like, there's a whole vetting process to, to get in. And, um, yeah, I told Deb, I said, you know, <laughs> I have a whole bunch. And so I was sending her pictures of them and she texted them to Dave and Dave was like, well, he just show up in costume. <laughs> That's it true. was great. So I got a set visit through that, saw so much and was just like dying on the inside. Mm -hmm. I saw uh, Grogu before that show aired, like they, you know, Baby Yoda. I was like, I saw him in this, they were shooting the scene and I was like, what is that? Yeah. Are you Curious. kidding me? And they're like, don't, don't tell anybody. What was like the onset name? There was, my recollection was, when I saw it, there was no, there was no name for it. No name. They, okay. they weren't calling him uh, Grogu. They just, there was, it was the child. I was like, that's like a baby Yoda. Yeah. So that's why <laughs> that's the, the quickest sort of, you know, identifier right there. It wasn't baby Yoda, but it was of his species, obviously. But yeah, it was just like, this is going to melt the internet. This is going to absolutely melt the internet. Which it absolutely uh, And then, did. you know, I got to see all that, have dinner with Dave Filoni and Deb, and then, um, you know, really connected with Dave. Uh, and then six months later, I got a call from my agent saying, hey, Lucasfilm, <gasps> they want to know your availability. And I was like, we will burn down forests. <laughs> I will, like, we will do whatever it takes for me to get there. I will show um, my pants. <laughs> and so it was, yeah. It was great. And so like being, being on the set, like just being able to live that dream. Yeah. It, it's just like, there's so many pinch me moments when you're behind the curtain and you see how it's, you're there while it's being made. And everybody who's on working on those sets is a super nerd uh -huh. and loves Star Wars as much as, as everybody else. That's and great. you see the pride and the joy in every department and everybody's geeking out and they've all got their geek shirts on <laughs> or the swag and the buttons and they're making stickers for each department. And there's such a joy in creating, make, we're making a Star Wars type thing, right? It's great. And for me to be a part of that in, in my little way was just like phenomenal. And then to be asked back to do, yeah. you know, Book of Boba Fett yeah, yeah. was awesome. Like, it's, it's just like, keep, if, as long as they keep asking me back, I will go. Because that is, it is such a fantastic experience. And it's just like, you want to relive your, your wildest dream again? Come on back. Yeah. And amazing. they announced at, uh, they didn't announce it, but they, they leaked it at uh, Star Wars Celebration that I'm going to be in season three of Mandalorian. So I'm really happy because I can finally talk. To, I, I don't have to lie about it and kind of go. <laughs> so it's great. So I'm really excited because they're, they, they liked my character and they liked the work I did on it so much that they, they asked me back. And that's a goal as, as a professional is you want to be asked back. You want to make an impression. You want the, the fans and the producers and the, everybody to like your character enough to bring you back. And you want everybody to like you as a human being uh, and as a professional enough to ask you back. That's, that's a point of pride I take. But I will admit, I thought I was going to have massive nosebleeds the entire time. <laughs> I was just trying to contain my joy and like, be professional, be professional, be professional. It's like, oh my God, it's Carl Weathers. Oh my God, oh, oh my God, oh my God, it's Pedro Pascal. You know, it's stuff like, oh my God, it's, 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 it's John Favreau. Like I'm a huge John oh, Favreau gosh. fan as yeah, well. John Favreau's right? like, great. That's crazy. That's he true. was, when, when Swingers came out, I was, oh, man, swingers. I was in university when Swingers came out and like, that was my jam. Like his movie spoke to me so hard. And, uh, that you was know, the one I, with I just, Vaughn, right? and he's, yeah, geez. yeah, yeah. And he's like a huge nerd too. And he loves, that's the other thing. There's so much love in that. Like they are all super nerds and they love doing, making these stories. And it, it's that same feeling when people go, oh my God, Paul, you're just so, so down to earth and you're so, you're just normal. Yeah. Right. 
It's great to hear that the people making the properties and Star Wars are actually big, huge fans of the property themselves. Yeah, it's like, like then as a fan it. of the property, you feel like it's in good hands. Yeah. Uh, can yeah. I ask you? Yeah. Was there ever a moment when you're on the set, like you're like, man, I really want to, I really want to take Baby Yoda. <laughs> I just want to borrow. You mean it. take souvenirs? Yeah. Or just like, <laughs> cold or, take souvenirs. Yeah. Or like you see pieces from the set, you're like, I need that. <laughs> I need a blaster right now. Yeah. I, you know what? It's look, but don't touch. Like, honestly, you look at it and you go, wow, that would be great. Like, I, I am a replica prop a builder myself, right? Mm -hmm. And a collector is like, so I have like lightsabers here. This is yeah. from the video game. This is Cal Kestis. Oh, wow. This is Obi Wan Kenobi's. I've got. Oh, oh. Paul's going into the vault. Yes, he's going he to is. that storage shed. <laughs> yeah, he's going to. I got this DL44 blaster. Oh, dang. oh shit! Look at that. So I got this for for my for my birthday. My wife got it for me, right? So it's like happy belated birthday. Thank you. Thanks. I turned fifty. Yeah, I was saying. You turned. You turned. Yeah, you, you, said you turned to five zero. I was like, <laughs> no, I know. I just everybody can. If you want to find out anything about anybody, if you dig deep enough, you can get it. So I'm sure, like, now, nah, okay, That's just um, lean right into it then. That's true. But uh, it, it is the the temptation. You, you look at it, and go, oh man, that would be so sweet. To <laughs> but it's like you would come on. Do you want to come back? Do you want to keep working? Do you want to be known as that asshole that got fired because he tried to smuggle out a prop <laughs> up his ass? Like, no, you can't do that. Like, no, where's Baby Yoda? <laughs> he's, he's <gone. laughs> Paul's right. running in the opposite direction. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I kind of want to get into like yeah. Kim's convenience and that whole era just a little bit. You mentioned this before. Absolutely. You've been around the industry for a little bit now, and you've seen probably your most success during your time on Kim's convenience. One thing that I've always been curious of, mm -hmm. is that family dynamic on Kim's reflective of, I guess, your own dynamic growing up Korean-Canadian? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. When Ince, Ince Choi, who's a creator of Kim's Convenience, like, because Kim's Convenience started as a play. Yes, yes first of all. Yep. You were part of the play. That was, like, yeah, I helped originate the role of Up. I helped develop it. Um, and I remember reading the first draft and going to Ince and saying, like, did you, have you been spying on my family? <laughs> Because I was Janet, like in the story, I was Janet, right? Like I wanted to go off into the arts and my parents were like, no, you're not going to be able to do that. Like that's, come on, be smarter yeah. type thing. But the one of the, I think one of the reasons why Kim's is so successful is because it is so authentic and yeah. it's recognizable and it's familiar and it's, it's believable because we all understand most of that dynamic we've all either experienced it or we've seen it and like and that and that's a thing and it rings absolutely true and so yeah that dynamic in kim's convenience is absolutely something uh that i draw from my own personal experiences from now it might not be exactly exactly i mm -hmm. mean up uh he is you know my dad <laughs> A lot of the upper that I play on TV, a lot of his 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 uh, mis mischievousness mischievousness <laughs> is from my upper. Oh, like okay. Yeah, he can be a clown. <laughs> the fieriness, though, of him, the the really sort of like the brat, is my mom. Is my oh. own mom, right? My mom had the temper. My my upper was really sort of quiet and very very reserved. When he got mad, though, he got <laughs> yeah. The you, Korean you know, came so. out. Yeah. Yeah, and it was just like, oh, we're done now. <laughs> like everything, let's pack it all in. It's been a good life. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Uh, sayonara. <laughs> yeah, but with, with my oma, it was, she was the one with the fiery temper who yelled a lot and this and that. But like all out of love. It wasn't like she was, my parents were never um, vindictive or cruel. Or It's like a lot yeah. of times when they yelled, it's because we deserved it. Right. That's true. Right? And so... That's what I draw from. And so with Appa, it's like everybody goes, oh my God, he's so mean. It's like, he's not being mean. No. He might be blunt, exactly. but it really is him sort of, he loves his family so much. And that's the thing I've come to realize as I've become a parent as well, or as I've grown up, is like looking back at how my parents, how much they did for my sister and I growing up and how much we didn't really appreciate that or take that for granted until... We had to live life for real. Yeah. That was an eye opener. That's that's, true. that's like the true growing up when you see, oh my God, yeah, they sacrificed so much and they never complained. Mm. Yeah. And it was just one of these things where you kind of go, okay, okay, I get it. And so that translated directly into my portrayal of Appa because the way he's written uh, reflects that as well is he would do anything for his family. Mm -hmm. And when he does stupid things, it's because he thinks he's helping. 
But that's where, and again, it's a sitcom, so that's where a lot of the conflict comes from. It's somebody trying to help or doing their version of this is going to help and it not helping at all and going the opposite way. Yeah. That's where the conflict comes from and a lot of the, the humor comes from that. But the, the, that's the thing about Appa is that's, I think the majority of the humor came from that, that miscommunication in terms of intention, not in terms of uh, speaking wise, because I think a lot of people initially, especially thought, oh my God, Kim's Kimmy is so racist. That accent is mm. so fake. How could they do? There was such pushback before Kim's even aired. During the stage play days. Uh, a little bit of pushback during the stage play. And it was funny because it was primarily non-Asian people who were upset with it. And uh, I found that very telling. Yeah. It was, uh, there was a little bit of white knight sort of, uh, we, we, I will step, step up and speak on behalf of this, this community that doesn't have a voice type thing. It, it's, it, there was a lot, there was a couple, a couple, I'm not going to lie. There were a few people like that. I remember we had a talk back in Winnipeg and an older woman stood up and, and she said, During the and play. I'm sure with the, the best of intentions, but she said, you know, I had a lot of trouble understanding you on stage. Mm. And I think that if you just slowed down and articulated your words more, you would be better, it would be better served. And the, the rest of the audience just sort of groaned. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And I said, you know, thank you so much for your feedback. And I understand that I do employ an accent and it is very difficult for you to, it, couldn't, it can be very difficult for some audience members to, to sort of, to understand. But think about now how my character feels. Yeah. He is an intelligent, educated man who cannot communicate yes. clearly. How frustrated do you think he felt during the play when people couldn't understand him? Mm, and that's right. kind of reflective of your experience there. And that's purposefully done. Wow. He is speaking in a language that is not his own. It will be accented. You'll have difficulty um, understanding him. But I find it's the same if I go to watch... Uh, something with, and somebody's employing an Irish accent, a thick Irish brogue, or an English accent. Mm. Sometimes it takes your ear like a few minutes to- Yeah, just to adjust to it. Yeah, phonetically. Yeah, and then you're like, okay, I understand what they're saying. But at the very beginning, you're like, what did they say? <laughs> right. And it's the same thing. But I think with Asian languages, a lot of times they go, oh, this is just like, I can't. It's interesting. That level of, of uh, patience mm. doesn't quite translate. That's a really it's good very, point. very, or they make a bigger deal out of it uh, which yeah. is than anything else, right? And it, yeah, it's getting better, but I mean, that's kind of, that was, and I'm talking like, you know, 2011, like 11 years ago, that's kind of how it was. We've gone a long mm -hmm. way since then. Absolutely, right? Thank like, God for that. Back then, a show like Lost was one of the first of its kind to have subtitles, to have characters actually speak in Korean. Daniel Day right. Kevin, and, yeah, 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 with his wife. Have the subtitles. The, you know, and back then there was a big gamble. Oh, we don't know if we're gonna, if we're gonna lose audiences because of this. I don't know. Now it is. It's, it's out there. Nobody. Yeah, it's totally normal, and people don't care, which I love. Yeah. Because you shouldn't, and the performance is way better when it's in somebody's native, or if it's in the native language in which the characters are supposed to communicate. It's like when Squid Game came out, people were like complaining about the voiceover. They're like, it's terrible. You know, like when the director went for Parasite, mm. saying same thing. It was like the dub version may be for whatever technical reasons or right. budget reasons not be as high quality. Yeah. But you should try to embrace that property and try to watch it in its original language with the subtitles. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Cause then there are a lot of like mannerism, tones that right. that the actor is portraying in his language that you are not gonna get from a dub version. Yeah. Paul, just you mentioning about that woman getting up in the play and what she said, that actually got me really pissed. And you handled <laughs> it really well. Going back to what you said about your character, you know, like it's an intelligent person. You know, Appa is an intelligent man. Mm. My dad, mm -hmm. the same thing he tells me all the time. He's like, son, you know, coming here from Korea, people, when they hear me speak English, they think I'm, I'm, I'm a dumb person. But yeah. I'm, I'm a smarter than 95% of these people. <laughs> yeah, It's just yep. because I can't speak English properly, but I understand it. I just can't speak it. Yeah, yeah. But people will yeah. judge me for it. And that really hit home when you said that. So, yeah. yeah. Well, there's, there's a line in, in, in Kim's, uh, the play, it's when he's, he's saying to Janet, you know, you know, Janet, call police, call police. And she's like, no, why don't you call him? He's like, they hear accent that they don't take us serious. Mm. Mm. And it's true. That yeah. is true. It, it's yeah. like, and that, that's like from you know, my, my, I remember that too. My dad said, you call the police. I said, why? So because they won't take me seriously. Yeah. If I call, they'll hear my voice. Yep. And I go, oh, okay. Man. All right. But if they hear somebody speaking unaccented English. Right. Then they'll, there's a bit of a bias. I mean, this was again, decades ago. And hopefully it's better now, but still. 
so many small things in that show that when you see it being portrayed on TV, yeah, yeah. we're both first generation Americans and yeah. our parents had to go through a lot of the same struggles. And exactly, seeing that yeah. being portrayed and seeing like the little minute difficulties that you don't even consciously think about, right, but then yeah. seeing it yeah, on yeah, screen, man. you're like, oh yeah, that's like, why we did X, Y, and Z. Exactly. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, you're right. Can I ask as the show got, when they kept you know, rising in popularity, did you have like start noticing like the importance of like the impact it was having on the Asian community? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, when it started, it was a gig for us. It was work. We weren't like going out there. We're going to represent. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. It's like, we're getting work. Work yeah, is work. Yeah, yeah, exa yeah exactly. Yeah, that, that's how it started. Like, Ince started. He made, he started writing Kim's Convenience to create work for himself, not hmm. to represent a community or the set. And he hmm. started it. Uh, he wrote about it because it's like, you write what you know. And... That's the thing. He wasn't trying to go, well, I'm going to show the Korean community in a different light and this is going to be... That wasn't his end goal. That was a great byproduct of it, but right. he wanted to tell a story that was true uh, to him, like a truthful sort of like uh, a story that rang authentically and stuff. And so it, when this play hit and we all started working and then we did a cross Canada tour, it was about being able to make a living. Paying okay. bills. We're going to make money and we're going to be able to, you know, pay our mortgages and put food on the table and this and that. But as we went along, I remember we were halfway through the tour and Ince suddenly piped up and said, hey, do you guys realize that this is the first ever Asian Canadian play to ever tour the country? And we're like, oh, oh, crap. Because you're so busy just trying to. Yeah, just do it. It was work. Like we were trying to just do really good work. You didn't know what was going on, how big it was. Yeah, you know, we, we just like, let's just do excellent work. We yeah. want to do excellent work. And as it went on, then all these things became endowed on it. And it got sort of attached where it was like, this show is representing this, this these communities in mm -hmm. a way yeah. that is, they've never been represented before. Again, that was a byproduct of just trying to tell an excellent, authentic, believable story that was entertaining. Yeah. And in a way that wasn't idealizing a, a community. Like saying, you know, kind of going, oh, they're perfect or this or that. Like the, the Kim family had a lot of warts. People made mistakes. We fought. We yelled at each other. It was, you know, people made mistakes. We weren't perfect by any means. And that's what I loved about it. We weren't turned into, you know, it's like not the model minority myth. Mm. Right. It was, this was a family dynamic that you didn't have to be Korean to understand. Definitely. It was an immigrant family dynamic. And so we got a lot of people from across the world saying this is this is my dad or that's my uncle that's my mom that's my grandmother that's my aunt that's my sister that's my brother you know <laughs> it was we got a lot of that from non-korean people and it just came down towards just being truthful about what the family dynamic was the family just happened to be korean again though as it went on the importance in terms of what it meant to the community the korean or the asian community mm -hmm. in particular uh was not lost on us either and it became a a target of opportunity where it was like, it's like a sports star, you know, they make it big and this and that. And they're like, well, I didn't ask to be a, a I didn't ask to be a role model. You know, I can do what I that want. Is very I don't true. care. That like, is why is it on true. me? And I kind of understand that. But at the same time, when you are put in that position to a community that is traditionally underrepresented, mm -hmm. then it is, I believe your duty. To, I said duty. Uh, it is <laughs> honestly, it's your, it's, that's your job. You have to represent yeah. because, and whether you like it or not, if you want the good, you got to take the response with great power comes great responsibility. That's not just for Spider-Man. That's for Uncle everybody ben. else. Yeah. And that's, I think that's part of the price to pay. Yeah. If you're going to get a lot of benefits from being recognized and this and that, mm. then for, for a community that, that needs it. Sure. Now the flip side of that is where do you draw the lines? Because there are, uh, Tons of people, tons of really worthwhile causes and things. And they reach out and say, use your platform, use your platform, use your platform for right, this. Yeah. Oh, that's true. And it's yeah. like, okay, well, you need to be selective. And I think, and people who are doing that need to be respectful about that as well. Because it's, I can't, I, I try to do, for example, for me, I try to do as much as I can. But I can't be 24-7. Of course not. Promoting every, because if you start doing that too then the power of your voice gets diminished because it's like, this guy's shelling everything. Yeah, and you seem a bit um, disingenuous sometimes. Yeah, exactly. And the last thing people need is some celebrity telling them what to do or how to act or this or that. 
And so for us with the, in terms of the Asian community, it is like, we represent them and we speak on behalf of the Asian community because we are traditionally, A, I am Asian and traditionally we are underrepresented. And so to have positive voices, successful stories is something that, yes, because I directly benefit from my profile in that community. So mm -hmm. I will give back to that community. You know, that's, that's the thing. That's the ebb and flow, the give and take. And I'm, I'm happy to do that. Yeah. Um, but there's some other things where it's just like, that's out of my purveyance. I can't speak to that. I understand you want that visibility of the profile, but I have no connection to it. And if I don't have that connection to it, then it feels disingenuous. It feels that makes sense. inauthentic. Yeah. Right. And so that that's where for me, and at the same time too, like mental health is important. So I need those boundaries. Of course, you got to find balance in your life too. Yeah. Can I ask, speaking about like, you know, the platform and stuff and taking on the role as America's Appa, right? Our dad. Do you feel like, I guess, in your professionalized post, Kim's Convenience, you ever felt trapped sometimes or like overwhelmed? Oh, you, you mean way? like in that role of Appa? Yeah. It's, it, that's an interesting question because I don't know if I feel trapped. Uh, I think I always try to convey myself as a professional, as somebody who's kind hearted. I mean, one of my mottos is kindness first. Mm. You treat everybody the way you want to be treated with respect. It doesn't matter where they're from or what level they're, doesn't matter. Like that is your human being, the human being. And so I try to carry myself professionally and personally that way. I tell my boys, <laughs> be respectful, be kind. Yeah. It's, it's just, that's, that's just how you, and then you don't have to worry about it. Like, it it's not like I'm putting on a persona and I'm going out and I'm going to be really nice because I have to be nice because people are, are watching me and this and that. It's like, no, just fucking be nice. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like that's it. Be it's genuine really about it. I love simple. That. Yeah. And that's it. And so for the role of Appa, it's just like Kim's Convenience was a wonderful experience in the la launching pa platform for uh, me professionally. Mm -hmm. But as well, I mean, it also marked a point in my life where I leaned into where I came from. Yeah. For the longest time, I didn't want to be Korean. Huh. I, you know, I, I just, wow. I yeah. wanted to fit in. I didn't want to eat Korean food. I didn't want to go to Korean school. Wow, I just, yeah. let me just... Do the shit that everybody else is doing. Yeah. Right. I didn't want that. And so there was a big pushback for me when I was younger. And I wish I could go back in time and cuff myself in the back oh my of the God. head and oh, say, yeah. hey, dude, like this is this is something that will make you infinitely more rich mm -hmm. inside and will help your relationship with your parents even more if you do that little bit of extra world work and just be grateful and thankful and and stuff like stop trying to fit into everything else and really just lean into who you are right now because that's who you are your parents and this that's who you are and so my my career was going okay you know personal life was going okay it was was good no big complaints but it wasn't until i started leaning into where i came from that that i started finding that success Got you. And it was so funny because I, you know, the irony is not lost on me that for so long I tried to push away being a Korean immigrant. Yeah. But my success came by playing <laughs> a <laughs> Korean, Korean immigrant, <laughs> you know, on the on you know on TV on the stage and screen. And so it was just like wow. And I I sort of this is a message that I try to tell a lot of young people too. It's just like embrace where you came from, whether yeah. you like it or not. Love it's it. who you are. Yeah. So don't fight. You accept it. If there are things that you don't like about it, like if you come from a really sort of like a terrible, violent background, I get it. Not, I'm not saying lean into it and start being violent yourself, but it's like, that's where you came from. You got to accept that. And you can make that change and stuff, but don't try to hide it. It is, this is who you are. And don't spend your energy pushing against that. Mm. Yeah. Put your energy into uplifting yourself, being positive and moving on from that and, and, and realizing that, yeah, this is a part of where I came from. And I can't change that, but I'm going to take every positive element of that to help me move forward. Oh, that's so great to um, hear. Yeah. A lot of sometimes what we do with this podcast is we try to have, have a good time, obviously, but the narrative is that we try to lean into both our cultures a little bit more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're living proof that you're never too old to like, and this is not a jab on your age, Paul. It is, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> At any point in your life, you could always make that reversal in your state of mind in terms of leaning into your own culture. That's kind of what we do with this podcast as well. Yeah. Both for the positive, obviously, but also there are flaws with it too that we talk about that we try to be open and genuine about as well. Yeah, that's true. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And the cool thing is too, I mean, a lot of times I thought it was just me. Like I'm the only one sort of feeling this. And it's like, it, it's an isolating experience sometimes until you start speaking 
with other like I, I started like I never hung out with Korean Korean Canadians. I never really? had I'd like my yeah my my peer group because there weren't very many around oh. where I grew up yeah, right yeah, yeah, and yeah. so it was just like oh you feel very isolated and there were a few families this or that and your kids were for just kind of forced to hang out but it was always like. Ugh. It's like I'm hanging out with people who look like me. And I don't want to be, you know. It's like one of those things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it wasn't until I was older and I started chatting with other people around my age group who had that similar sort of like isolationist feeling that we all realized, holy shit, you felt that too. Oh, I thought it was the only one. And then you realize, like, oh my god, like we all were feeling it, and we all thought we were the only ones. Yeah. And if we had only just connected about it, and so that's the other thing about what I love about what you're, you both of you are doing is you're creating an atmosphere or environment where people can connect and talk about these shared experiences, positive and negative. Yeah. Because it's like, you know, like you say, yeah, our communities are not perfect. There no, are, there's, we have the not. same problems as every other community. Of course, Systemic all racism, violence, all these things. Absolutely, we do. We are not a model minority. And, you know, we can't just pretend that we are perfect. We're not. Nobody is. But what's really important is being able to go out and connect with people with shared experiences, have these conversations, these difficult conversations too sometimes, and really, really let's, how do we grow? How do we build from that? You don't build and grow by denying a situation exists. Nope. Yeah. You don't. You can't sweep it under the rug, which is like, that seems to be the, the Asian playbook. Don't speak <laughs> about it. Just shh, it's Asian playbook, rug, yeah. you know, brush under the carpet and we'll pretend it never happened. It's like, Repress. Yeah, that that is not a way to heal or to correct. That's just a way to just sort of make things a little bit more comfortable for a while. It's like a band aid solution. You cover it up, doesn't exist. It's like yeah, it does. It's still under that band aid, and one day that band aid is going to fall off, and there's going to be hell to pay type thing, right? You know, that's why like when I talk about what other non Asian friends and everything, the importance of Asian representation on TV, uh, on social media, everywhere is more than just about it being important to us within our community. It's about like mm -hmm. normalizing the presence of us more than just like us trying to get our fair share of things. 100%. This is a obvious question. You must have had a lot of difficulties uh, during your career coming up and trying to, I guess, get roles and trying to come into the industry as a Korean Canadian. Oh yeah. <laughs> like, fuck. If you, if you look at my, yep. if you look at my <laughs> resume, it's all like, like I said, my speciality <laughs> was exposition, and it was like I never got a chance to play real characters, like real human beings. It was just I was a fucking plot device, like a yep, character yeah. to put into to to just push. The, it was never my narrative, my character's narrative, and and that's fine. Like there are, like I get it. Like my role was to service somebody else's narrative, and that was okay. Um, you know, so I'm not going to shit on the, the roles I got. Yeah. What I will shit on was the fact that I never got the opportunity to audition yeah. for roles where it was my character's narrative because of the color of my skin. I mean, mm. I speak unaccented English and back in the day in the nineties, I never was even considered for a lot of these roles. Like my agent could submit me to audition mm -hmm. and casting agents would go, nope. We're, we're casting, we're, we're going into, we're, we're going with white people, basically. This yeah. was the 90s. And so a lot of the roles I went off was like storekeeper, doctor, cab driver, like sub, like all these small Sorry, sort of dry characters. Cleaners. Yeah, or like gang member number one, or like <laughs> Asian shit henchmen. like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's it, or the villain, right? Which is like, oh, okay. I mean, oh, and I shit. will admit too, at the time as well, I was going bald. In my 20s, I was balding. Yeah, oh, shit. and so that sort of screwed me in so many ways because it was like I was too old looking to play characters oh, in my God. age grade, range because I was losing my hair. That's and so I, I was only that. getting auditions for fucking old guys. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like in your 20s. Like, yeah, I go in, it's like, dad. He's like yeah. in his 50s. I'm like 22 sitting there with all these old Asian dudes. <laughs> He's like, I'm that's like, our grandfather. Fuck. Dude, I'm, yeah. I just graduated college, man. <laughs> what the hell? So it was shit like that. And so, yeah, it was tough. It was really tough to get parts. And I really loved acting. Yeah. And it was one of those things where I think the discussion I had with, for myself, with myself was, do you still want to be an actor? Yes. Oh, yeah. Then you need to change your narrative. Looking back at it, it was like, they're never going to let me audition for these, these lead roles. Maybe a supporting role, but I'm never going to get a lead role. What do I do? It's like, well, 
I'm, I'm doing character work. Okay, so be the best character actor you can. Nice, yeah. Do your work. Adapt. Put in the reps. Yeah, you adapt. You see how you can excel. Be ready. So when you go in, you make you make a mark with the work, your prep, all these things, your professionalism. And when you're on set, learn as much as you can. Not just about the act of, you know, the craft of acting. Talk yeah. to the other performers, you know, if, if they're willing to. But also talk to crew. Find right. out what they do, right? Ask, learn, because how many opportunities are you going to get to be on set? I remember my first day on set, I didn't know anything about film acting. Mm -hmm. I, I trained in the theater. So I didn't know what, what you know, marks meant or where the can like how important the cameras were or where sound was or, or the lighting or any of this stuff. Right. Didn't know any of that. And so, you know, when you're starting off, how often do you get a chance to work on a set? So when you're working there, learn as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the biggest thing is as well, be fucking prepped, be ready for it. Don't just show up and like go, Oh, I've made it. And like fucking sit like you can't like, honestly, if you want to work again, be yeah. prepped that's, show up that's Lindsay. Lindsay's always like be prepared he literally always tells me you gotta just make sure you're always on uh, paul you shit. don't know ben well enough yet but i have to be prepared for two people because uh ben is uh the opposite <laughs> of what you just said so not only do i need to prepare for myself i need to prepare on ben's behalf <laughs> we've been friends since we we're like since elementary school 30 plus years <laughs> yeah which that's is uh, amazing. which is unfortunate because i haven't seen much that's evolution from ben. <laughs> wow i'm right here man but I was going to say, uh, Paul, um, you know, I know you said you're going bald. Um, my dad is bald. So I'm like, you know, I'm like, I'm preparing myself for the whole, you know, <laughs> taking finasteride. I'm taking biotin. I'm just trying wow. to keep as much follicles as I can. <laughs> are, are you losing your hair, though? I, it's definitely starting to thin. Not not like okay. the receding, but the crown part, I guess you call. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, I feel it. It's coming. Well, how old are you, though? I'm 35. Oh, yeah. Okay. So You it's, know what? I honestly, it's, it's that whole, from what I heard, if you don't start losing it heavy by the time you're in your forties, you're fine. Really? Right. So I think, yeah, yeah. It's like, knock on wood. Paul's giving you some hope. Thank it's you. It's one of those things. And like, there's so many fallacies where it's like, well, it's all from your mom's side of the family. It's not. If anybody in your family is balding, genetically speaking, you might have, you might be <laughs> predisposed to that. Right. Exactly. So. But I got to say your beer game is so strong. Thank you. That's the thing. Thank like, you. yo, it's your thing. It's synonymous <laughs> with you. I've got a full head of hair. Yes. Which I am very proud of. Yeah, I know. I'm, yeah. Enjoy. I'm not proud of the fact that I cannot connect <laughs> this part of my face. It's a peninsula up here. A peninsula. And then it's like an island down there. I can't connect any of this. So, to the both of you who have a strong beard game, <laughs> I'm very much jealous. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Sorry, but um, going back to what you're saying about like finding work and adapting. Did you ever think about like, yo, I'm going to fucking just quit acting. Like, I can't do this shit. No. No. Wow. Like, truthfully and honestly. That's surprising. Uh, wow. Awesome. Yeah. Just Fuck yeah. too stupid and too stubborn to quit. I that's, like that. That's honestly what it was. <laughs> Damn. Um, yeah. I, I, one of my friends, one of my close, dear friends uh, often talks to me about this. Uh, he He's a lawyer now and we were in the, we were in the same drama program and he was like a year behind me. Mm -hmm. And I remember... He, we talk about this and he talks about it very fondly because he's very proud of me. He says, you know, I remember in university, I was like, yeah, but what's your backup? What are you going to do if you don't get in? Yeah. And he said, I don't have one. <laughs> I'm just going to do it. Yo, and he's just I like, like and at the time I thought you were the biggest idiot, <laughs> but here you are. Yeah. And it's true though. Like I get it. He only, he does it because he loved me. And he's like, I don't want to see you I like a that. bum on the streets type thing. And that's kind of, that's how my family was too. It's like, they didn't want to see me suffer. You know, but acting is suffering. It is. Right? Yeah. Like, that's that's part of it. But Starving um, artist kind of oh, thing. Oh, that's crazy. That conversation that you had with your friend is basically me talking to Ben. Yo, that is. And, he, and Linji will say the same. She's like, God, Ben, you're such a fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Um, uh, just a couple more things and then we'll wrap this up. Yeah. You've been around. And once again, Paul, I'm not jabbing at your age. It really sounds like <laughs> it. But these questions... Dude, this is the third time. <laughs> you, can't, you can't keep Linji, saying I don't it. care. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine pull out the jameson <laughs> um you've been around long enough that you've seen all the shitty stuff are you encouraged by what we've seen the past five to ten years or so oh starting with what you did on kim's convenience starting yeah. with that fresh off the boat um 100 yeah. percent. crazy rich asians that huge asian wave yeah 100 percent. we are so far ahead now as a community and as as a talent base a talent pool 
we are so much further ahead than we were when I started. And to be honest, I never thought I'd live to see this day. Really? Where we are this far ahead. Yeah. The community has been talking about diversity and inclusivity since before I started acting. And it's been like a long time. And the biggest change now, I think, is like, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these shows where they said, oh no, the Asian market, you know, Asians aren't marketable stars or performers. Mm. Or they're not as talented or this or that. We've proven them wrong. The talent has always been there. It's a willingness to create these shows. And these shows are being made now because, I mean, and let's be frank about it, because uh, there were shows that made money. Oh yeah. It's all about the money. Yeah. Crazy Rich Asians makes a huge splash in the North American box office. And suddenly... Asians are marketable. You know, it's that one of these is things. So true. You you look in Asia, we make, you know, hundred million dollar movies, movies that make billions of dollars. There's a strong market there, but for whatever reason, because it's Hollywood, it's like very self-centric. Yeah. It's like this is it. This is it for the world. Oh, the Brits maybe. Maybe some French films and maybe some other <laughs> art European art house films. But Asia, nah, all they do is kung fu movies and like gangster films and this and that, right? And so it's a huge untapped market. So the short sightedness of that aside, for the longest time, and you know, you would hear this too from from certain other creatives. It's like, well, they're just not marketable. These these people, nobody knows who they are, and so and the community never comes out to support. So mm. why would we make a movie? And in a movie like Crazy Rich Asians, combined, ching, like cash is in. Yeah. Uh, and then all of a sudden, it's like, oh. Well, we believe in diversity and inclusivity, and we would like to, you know, and it's like, come on, let's be fair. And that's fine. Yeah, it's completely fine. It's like, make your money. But at the same time, don't turn it into like just some sort of cheap cash grab, where it's like, we need to make as many copies of Crazy Rich Asians as we can. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to oversaturate the market, and we're going to dilute it so much. Like, you can make other stories. You don't have to ghettoize everything and reduce it down to one same friggin' story. You can draw from this talent pool and audiences will find them and you will be able to, to, to be profitable off yeah. of other stories as well. And the thing is, then you change it from being a trend to being an actual movement. Right. Because that's what you want. Yes. Crazy with changes. That was, it became very trendy. And a lot of questions I was asked around that time was, do you think this will continue? Can this momentum keep going? And I right. said, yeah, it can, but it depends on the types of stories that we make, that we tell, that they're not derivative from Crazy Rich Asians, that we show that we are capable of so much, just as much as everybody else. And let's build on that momentum instead of cashing in really quick and then checking out. Right. But I think we are, there is a plethora of talent that is out there that is finding footing, that is getting funding, that is getting the stories told. And we're moving in the right direction for BIPOC artists, not only in front of, but behind, behind the as well, camera yeah, exactly. as well. Writers, and directors, that's, that's creators. Where, yeah. And that's really where the biggest change needs to come because putting somebody in front of the camera is easy. Giving somebody of color the responsibility of making decisions is way harder, but that's changing. And that's why I think there there is movement. The thing is, it is incumbent upon BIPOC artists then to be excellent. You can't just skate by because of the color of your skin. True. You can't. That can get you in the door, but once you're there, what do you do with that opportunity? Right? How do you grow? How do you make excellent work? And and that's the thing. You can't just say, okay, this battle is won. Now it's time for me to cash in. I'm gonna sit back <laughs> and I'm gonna do, you know, whatever. You, you need to like keep going. And that's always been the grind. Mm -hmm. It's always been the grind. Like whenever it's the next step, what's the next step? What's the next step? How do we expand? And then we will create another generation of artists, of producers, of direct, you know, creatives coming through. And the cool thing is too, there will be more success stories. And when you have more success stories, you have immigrant families or Asian parents going, they're successful. Do what they do. Go. Exactly. Instead right? of, I mean, that's why there's so there was so much pushback. There were no success stories. That's exactly so, the point. Because when you tell your parents you want to be a doctor or some you know stereotypical career like a lawyer, they can see the living example of that success. So to them, it makes sense. When you tell your parents you want to be an actor and actress, they have not yet true. seen enough examples of that being that successful to think that that is a realistic option for you. Right. That is very true. So that's true. It does grow the next generation. You know, speaking of that, there was an episode of Ken's Convenience where it was one of my favorite episodes. It was you, 
and Andrea, the daughter, she was a uh, she was doing photography, and she was showing you her like work and stuff, and you were just like, no, like this is not what you're doing.、Mm-hmm. Now they can't make money because、know. that's to the same point as well. Yeah. In that episode, maybe Abba hadn't seen a lot of examples of this being a like, successful、exactly. thing. Exactly. And then eventually, I remember you framed the picture, and then you were getting compliments, and you're like, "Oh, oh, this looks、yeah. nice." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then he sells all. <laughs> yeah, all yeah that, picture. That, that, you're like, "Oh, I couldn't make money." I was like, "Yeah, <laughs> see, aren't you happy? We made money." <laughs> yeah. yeah. We mentioned this on the past episode. It seems like now there's this transition, and I don't know if this is an actual thing or just me and Ben seeing it from the outside looking in. Yeah. You used to have more token agent roles within that project. Are we at the point where we're getting more token? Projects, more token Asian projects. So a whole project being token,、uh, as opposed to having the movie just have a token Asian actor or actress. Well, can you give me an example of a, a token movie? I really don't want to call out any shows. I've sometimes said that maybe we've made it when we're at the point where an Asian project is lit and is just mediocre, and that's okay. It doesn't have to be a, a runaway success for a project.、It、can just be a mediocre project. Okay. Okay. I think I understand what you're talking about. Well, here's the thing: nobody sets out to make a mediocre TV show or a movie. Nobody does. There are so many factors that are involved in making a program or or, or creating a story that the general public doesn't doesn't see or doesn't、mm-hmm. understand or doesn't care. Right? They just they get the final project. And the more and more I've been in this business, and the more I read chats and and comments about certain shows, the the more and more I, I I'm absolutely positive. Like people have no Clue, yeah. What goes into making a TV show? No clue whatsoever. They have this hyper idealized version of, well, why don't they just do this? It's like, <laughs> if it were that simple, <laughs> do you not think they would have done it? Like, there's so much involved when when there's money involved. There's so many decisions. There's different levels of decision making.、Mm-hmm. You have the directors, the producers. You have networks. You have studios. You have all these different layers. You have to work through sometimes. It's not as simple as well, you know, because if it were honestly, then it would be done. And so, you know, does that excuse mundane storytelling or poor storytelling? No,、yeah. no. But I will tell you right off the bat, no one sets off to make a shitty show. Fair enough. Nobody、yeah. does, right? And so things happen along the way, and sometimes they make choices that don't work out. Sometimes casting doesn't work out. Sometimes writing isn't as great. Sometimes productions are rushed out there. I wouldn't call it tokenism, though.、Mm-hmm. And、uh, what I really like,、uh, you know, that you brought up is, yeah, I, these shows are being made, though,、right. which I like. Now, what I have a problem with is when people write down and go, oh, you know, they, they come, oh, this is just a woke agenda. Oh, I'm like, yes, that is so、yes. fucking lazy. Like, honestly, then don't fucking watch it. Yeah, exactly. Just fucking skip like, it. Like, oh my god, they, they cast this female character、yeah. in this. Then don't fucking watch it. No one's forcing、yeah. you to watch anything. Yeah, then don't watch it. It's like all you do is complain. <laughs> like, if that's gonna take you out so much that you haven't even seen a frame、yes. of what's happening, you're、that's、gonna shit、thing. all they- over it. Come on. I mean, that that's the worst form of belly aching. And again, <laughs> that's true, man. These are trolls who just want attention, and, yeah, this, and that's、bored. why we need to shift that narrative away from that and kind of go, okay, that's fine, moving on. And you don't engage with them. Don't argue with somebody. Never on, feed the、uh, trolls. Like in a yeah, that's it. And then that they disappear. They'll move on to something else. And、yeah. that's a guarantee. When you see something as sort of explicitly inflammatory as that,、mm-hmm. you kind of go, okay, that boring old thing. Okay, moving on. And you just move on. And it's great. It's so much better for your mental health. Don't argue. You don't argue with an idiot online. <laughs> it's just like, ridiculous. It's like somebody explained to me this way. It's like trying to have a chess match against a pigeon, right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how beautifully thought out your move is or complex. The pigeon's just gonna knock over all the pieces, shit on the board, and strut around like it won. That's what it is. So don't do it. Don't do it. I'm picturing someone at the park. You know when they have like those chess boards and, and shit. And there's a pigeon there. And there's a pigeon just like moving around, knocking the pieces. It's just knocking in, shitting all over. Going, brruh, brruh, I won! I won! Yeah. So, but- no. <laughs> Speaking of strong fan bases,、um, yep. Your next project coming up. You play Iro on the live action adaptation of Avatar.、Mm-hmm. That fan base has very strong opinions. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. Oh yeah. Wrapped up filming, right? Yeah yeah.、I've、wrapped up filming back in June. June July. Yeah June. In June, end of June, yeah, I will say it, it's one of those things where it's got a very passionate fan base. Good way to put it. Yeah,、uh, I, Star Wars is the same. Star Trek is the same. Any franchise has you have diehard fans 
And the ones that speak negatively against a project without seeing anything, I think, again, it's a very small vocal minority. My big thing is just like, once it airs, and you can have, give me critical like yes. uh, arguments, fine. Right. But before you see it, if you are burying a show before you've seen anything about it based on, oh, I heard this or I heard that. Oh, like just straight up hating. Yeah, it's just like, okay, your life must be really hard if you're raging on That's true. about a show that you loved, which is awesome. Like if your life hinges <laughs> on the success or failure of a, a live action adaptation of a show. That person needs a I hug. I think maybe you need to take a breath. <laughs> I think you need a hug. I'm proud of the work that I did on that show. Uh, I love the cast. I love the writers. I love the directors. I love the crew. We had a great time shooting it. It was hard shooting that show. I'm proud of the work that I've done on it. The work that I've seen the other actors do was phenomenal. I got a chance to work with Daniel Day Kim. I got a chance to work with Ken Lung. Mm. I got a chance to work with a bunch of fabulous actors. And so for me as a nerd, as a professional, it was a great experience. For people out there who are still trying to compare it to the M. Night Shyamalan feature, that movie is now 10 years old. We had nothing to... But I understand as a fan too, the reluctance and kind of going, oh, I really hope... Yeah, they, they feel jaded. Up. Yeah, and I get that. But at the same time, just wait. And you can be like hopeful. You can exactly. be... I, and I get that as a fan. Yeah. You can be hopeful. You can be this or that. But like... If you're ready to shit on something and just burn it to the ground at the first mistake you spot, like, wow, that's a tough crowd. It is. And I don't know if anybody could make a show that's going like, to please everyone as perfect as that. No, and you can't. Yeah, just have like the right mindset going into it, you know? Just, yeah. Like, just have a neutral open, and mindset. Just, people should just take a breath, man. Yeah. Just, you know. Yeah. Paul's advice to everyone today is just take a breath, just relax, and try not to shit in your pants. Yeah, yeah. that's all. Just you know, enjoy Those are it. the three facts of life. <laughs> just sit back and enjoy. Exactly. So, you know. uh, But, uh, you know, a final note is there was an inordinate amount of care and respect taken Good into creating this adaptation of Avatar The Last Airbender. And no one's out to screw the fans, and no one's out to, to, to go, oh, this is my reimagining of it. Exactly. They, they stayed as true to the storylines as it could while still making it. I mean, you can't do a frame by frame. Of course not. Then yeah. why are you doing it? It is an adaptation. There are certain things that didn't won't translate as well. Yeah, from cartoons to actually live action. So, you know, they just take that in mind and like, honestly, sit back and enjoy there it. There you go. So. We did a lot of good work. One segment that we do at the end of every podcast just to wrap things up is it's a fun, good time. We, we, we call it ranting and raving. We take a second, us, uh, Ben and I and the guests take a second to rant about anything crappy going on in our lives or rave if you feel or, kind of like inspired and happy. Yeah. Most of the time, Ben and I are just bitching about things and we usually get the guests to bitch about things too. <laughs> Isn't that what I just did for the last hour? Yeah, exactly. Though? You've been like, <laughs> you've been the definition of bitter Asian dude uh. for the last hour. <laughs> Okay, one quick thing. I'll start this up. When you go to the uh, grocery store and you go to the vegetable section or the fruit section and they have those plastic bags that come in like a big um, roll. The roll shit, yeah. And you try to get it out. Okay. And especially during COVID days when you're still kind of putting on your mask and you're not really licking your fingers to like do the thing. Oh. <laughs> How the hell is any human being without oh. moisture on their fingers or that's sweating through the pupils of their fingertips? How are they supposed yeah. to open that flimsy plastic bag? Uh. Do you know what I do? I go to the vegetable section and I don't know if this is good. I'll touch a wet vegetable, like a broccoli. Oh. Like a, I'll touch a oh, like the lettuce section. Grab yeah. the ice. I would take the ice from the broccoli. Yes, and just like oh. wet your hands. Oh man, I'm a I'm a dick then. <laughs> Do you lick your fingers? I'm the dick that licks my fingers. Oh okay. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Anyways, plastic I vegetable bags in the grocery section. Someone please. There needs to be an invention to make this better. Now, Ben, as long as you're not licking your fingers and touching other people's faces, I think it's okay. Or wiping it on the other bags. Or touching I, the broccoli head or I something. I don't think I'm doing that. Hopefully not. <laughs> the vegetable thing, I will be using that now. Thank you for that uh, life hack. What about you, Ben? Oh, so there's like, I, wa I watch a ton of YouTube, but I don't have the free YouTube without the commercials and shit. Okay. There's that winter company, Arterex. Arterex? Ar 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 yeah, Arteries. Right? Arterex. Whatever. Yeah. Okay, what Arterex. <laughs> so they make really nice jackets and shit. But they have a commercial, and the commercial literally just starts off with the, the iPhone alarm going off. The sound? Yeah. Okay. And every time I just hear that, I just get, like, the worst PTSD. <laughs> what? I just, you know, because it's an alarm, you know? So it's oh. like, oh, shit. 
But like the guy, you know, the alarm goes off, but he comes out of his tent and he's like, "Oh, look at me! I'm I'm in nature." So you're triggered by the sound I'm, of that I'm alarm for triggered. the commercial. Yeah, <laughs> is this commercial like running very often? It, yo, I mean, I watch a I I watch a lot of not free premium YouTube, so yeah. I guess yes. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Artix, please, please change it. Uh, please change it for the love of God. It's the exact sound. It's the exact I- same, dude. It's perfect. They know what they're doing. <sighs> they, they, they got me. What about I'm, you, Paul? What do you got to oh God. continue bitching about? <laughs> Sorry. Maybe find something to rave about. No, I mean, geez, what can I say? Um, you know, I'll rave about you too because uh, I get a lot of requests to do uh, podcasts and stuff, and you might have noticed I like to talk a lot. Uh, and, really? Do you? Uh, I, I will admit, I, I honestly, um, I, I chose this one to say yes to, A, because the name was awesome. Worst Asian Podcast oh, was, Thank was great. You. B, yeah. uh, I want to support Asian artists and creators as much as I can. Um, but I'll say this, uh, chatting with the two of you has been so delightful. The best podcasts are the ones where you don't feel like you're being asked questions it's just a dialogue it's back and forth i love the fact that we could connect on so many different levels about different things that we have a shared experience and that despite my advanced age we were able to I find generational similarities <laughs> not, not once during this whole episode you're, did i mention you're, you're so right. full of shit <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna edit this and you're gonna be like oh shit <laughs> I love that the two of you have been friends since you were kids uh, in, you know, for over 30 years and that you still give each other shit and you still like each other enough that you're doing <laughs> this together. I'm really, really happy that we had this conversation. And the biggest telltale sign is when I've, when I've had a great time is you lose track of time. Oh yeah. It's, it's been, and it's like, way long. Yeah, we've been chatting now for like an hour and a half and it, it feels like 10 minutes, honestly. And we could keep going. Uh, and so that's, I mean, kudos to you guys. Good rant, but I hear you on the plastic bag thing. <laughs> Every once in a while, I would use the forehead sweat to do that. Cause I was too lazy. You kind of go, Ugh. that's a new one. Um, yeah. Does that only work when you're balding guys? I'm, yeah. I, I sweat a lot in general. <laughs> yeah. I'm just a so sweaty dude. Is that, that's one of those things, uh, with the Arcteryx thing, yeah. I have to say is, uh, their jackets are really expensive. I was in Vancouver yes. for six months and it rained for the six months. And so I ended up having to buy one of those freaking Arcteryx jackets. Uh, great jacket. Though. It's a great jacket. Like, That's what I hear. It's a rain jacket that costs 900 bucks. Yo, I have one, but it's really expensive. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I'm but like, I love the right? thing. I know. I heard they're yeah. like, they're like indestructible pretty much. Oh yeah. 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 All the crews use them. That's why I ended up buying one because everybody on the crew was you using them. Buy it. Okay. Paul, seriously, it's been great. Thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. Um, if people want to stay up to date with what you're doing on a daily basis, where can they cyber stalk you on the internet? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so many different ways. Uh, you can uh, tinder.com. <laughs> uh, there's a. <laughs> You can find him on oh, yeah. OnlyFans yeah. at Bitter Asian Dude. <laughs> OnlyFans, yeah. He has a platinum package ready for yeah. you as well. OnlyFans, yeah. Up his ass. Up his ass. They. Uh, <laughs> you can follow me on. Uh, I got a YouTube channel, Bitter Asian Dude Inc. Check it out. I do fun boxing Sundays, although I haven't done it in the last few weeks because it's been busy. But we're gonna get back to that. Yeah. Uh, that's Sunday night, seven o'clock Eastern. Uh, Bitter Asian Dude Inc. Where I unbox a geeky collectible, do a half-ass review, and then we chat. And we have a drinking game too. That's a lot of fun. Nice. You can also follow me on Instagram at Angry Appa. That's my Instagram handle. Uh, for whatever reason, I have a ton of followers on Instagram. But you can always check out uh, stories that I post or or some of the other crazy sort of silly Instagram stories, uh, Instagram posts. Really and whatnot mm-hmm. uh, and i'm also on uh what's that other one twitter the toxic one at uh bitter asian uh, elon dude. musk's personal app yes <laughs> there you go twitter uh, bitter asian dude yeah and so that's that's pretty much it if you haven't checked out paul's stuff on the internet you will be delighted to see all the stuff he's up to yeah and um i hear from a certain little bird that paul loves ketchup so if you ever yeah. see, oh, you if you ever see bastards. Paul, <laughs> just buy bastards. him a bottle of pines do not <laughs> He loves ketchup flavored chips. Variety 57, Fuck baby. Uh, that's like the best. So if you ever see Paul, tell him that you too yes. love ketchup. Get him the family Who? size. Family size. Who's to blame? Who's to blame? Who's to blame? What? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> ketchup is a garbage condiment. <laughs> I'm going to say that. Ketchup chips. And I know my ketchup fellow Canadians chips. are going to like vilify me for it, but ketchup <laughs> chips are garbage. <laughs> Save yourself the 10 minutes and just flush them right away because that's how long it's going to take for them to go through your system. 
yes. to squirt out your butt. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's all I'm saying. That's Paul's uh, his, uh, rant. <laughs> you should have used that you for your rant. There you go. Yeah, I should have. I should have. You, sh- you triggered me. I triggered, triggered. the PTSD. <laughs> all right, guys. If you want to see what Ben and I are up to on a daily basis, follow us on all the social medias at yes. Worst Asian Pod because nobody else wants to be called Worst Asian anything on the internet. <laughs> Follow us at Worst Asian Pod on every single oh. social media, same handle, or go to worstasianpod.com. You'll find links to everything from there. Gang, gang. Uh, see what Ben and I are up to on a daily basis, eating lots of ketchup chips. <laughs> I think I've just lost Paul as a friend. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. Just my respect. I love you. I just don't respect you anymore. <laughs> uh, on behalf of uh, Ben, Paul, and uh, who makes a uh, Heinz. On behalf Heinz, of Heinz. Baby. <laughs> Variety 57. We will catch you guys next week. Bye. Peace.